Yeah, so I was very anxious about all of this because I saw some videos of people casing and I was, I I honestly thought I could never do that. Hello everyone, my name is Kenton Cavestu. I'm an ex-BCD consultant, an ex-Googler, and the founder of Rocketblocks, an online platform that helps candidates prepare for interviews. And today I am sitting down with Daniela Fernandez. She is a recent graduate of the Darden School of Business. She is a former brand manager from Mattel, where she worked on the Barbie line, among others. And she is going to BCG Chicago starting shortly, and she interned there last summer as well. Uh, and she's also a singer-songwriter in some of her spare time. So, Daniela, it's great to have you here. Thanks for joining. Hi, Kevin. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. Uh, so we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff today that is all very relevant to your career and your uh, experience. Um, going to BCG Chicago, being a Rocket Blocks coach, helping other folks through the, the process as well. Uh, the first thing I really want to dive into and cover is just hear a little bit from you about how you thought about preparing for consulting interviews and what was your strategy as you were getting ready to go through that process. So let's let's start there. Okay, so I think I did a bunch of things to prepare for my, my consulting interviews. The first thing and the main thing that I did was like leaning into my school resources. So they have a career center that was amazing. They had a consulting club that helped prepare us how to case. They taught us how to case. They gave us access to some um, other tools. And also we had a second year coach. So it's someone above us who had already like gone through the process and he cased with me the whole time. Um, I think the second thing that I did that was helpful was building like a master guide of how to case. So every time that I cased, I would add new learnings into it. It's not, it was not like a framework that I could repeat. It was more like tips and tricks that I could not forget every mm. time I did a case and questions I had to ask and keeps that I things that I have to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. And that was super helpful for me. Um, and the last one was working on specific areas where I needed improvement. And for that, I used like rocket blocks to do more frameworks or to practice mental math. And then I downloaded some other apps of like how to do drills and just small problems just to solve those areas of improvement. Got it. Cool. Can you tell me a little bit more about that second part that's interesting? Like your Daniela's master guide of of how to how to go through this process. What sort, what's an example of a like a type of insight or something that you would have added to that as you were going through this process? Yeah. So I divided it in sections. Um, you know, normally the cases have similar a similar flow. Sometimes mm -hmm. it will not have a brainstorming. Sometimes it will not have, I don't know, a chart interpretation a, a part. But I added all of these sections that could be in it. And just steps. So, for example, on, on the chart clearing, first step, um, look at the numbers. Say out loud any doubts that you have. Uh, start building insights. Start thinking on what they want you to do with these numbers. So it was more like steps and things that I had to remember every time I ran into that section of the case, if that makes sense. Got it. So it was a resource that you were building up over time that would have talked about like structuring the case initially, how to, like you said, how to clear a chart, maybe how to summarize your findings at the end, just like all the different okay. components. Yeah, exactly that. How long was that doc by the end of the process? <laughs> well, I have it in many, like like some parts in digital, some parts physical. At the end, it was a mess. But <laughs> I don't know, like 10 to 15 pages probably. Got it. Awesome. Okay. Um, when you kicked off this process, you said it sounds like also your school was really helpful in, in pairing you up with a second year that was a case prep partner. Um the club obviously had like resources and, and was talking you through it. Were there certain things that when you started preparing for these interviews, you thought were going to be really important that turned out not to be that important? Like you were just like, as you yeah. learned more, you're like, oh, this doesn't, I thought this mattered, but it, it turns out it doesn't. Yeah. So I was very anxious about all of this because I saw some videos of people casing and I was I, I honestly thought I could never do that. Like I, I could never get to that point. So the first thing that I did is I bought a bunch of books 
on how to case and case prepping. And yeah. I started reading them and I had never done a case before. So most of the things that I read made absolutely no sense. Um, <laughs> and I think that was just a waste of time. So definitely reading books about casing was not great. Instead, learning more about industries or listening to podcasts, like there's other uh, like input resources that you can get that are more helpful. Mm. And those input resources that you're talking about, were they like, telling you, you mentioned like learning about industry. So is it like learning about like the airline industry a little bit so that if that comes up in the case, you feel some level of comfort of being able to discuss it? Or was it like podcasts about like, here's what a case interview is. And so you were learning about the format of the interview or both? Well, it's all of the above. Like okay. I signed up for newsletters on uh, with news just to okay. understand what's going on in the industries. And then I learned these, uh, my school provided like an overview, an industry overview of every industry just to yep. see how they work. Um, and then I also listened to podcasts um, on how people casing. I watched videos on people yep. casing. And all of that was super helpful as input, but definitely the best thing is just to do it yourself and practice yep. and practice and practice. Yeah. Completely agree with that. Like it all comes down to just going through the motions at a certain point. Like there's only so much you can learn from reading a book or watching a video. Like you got to just get out there and, and try it, right? Yeah. Oh. And it's so scary. And you're scared of your interviewer or mock interviewer judging you. But once you do the first one, it's like, okay, you have a, a starting point. Yeah. Tell me what, like you said initially, like you watched some videos. And you were like, oh, I could never, like, I could never do that. What what went through your head that made you feel that way that you were like, oh, this just feels unobtainable for some reason? Um, so I didn't understand there was an actual structure on casing. And I thought these people just came up with this incredible frameworks and just knew where the case was going for, like by magic. So that's what made me, like it gave me imposter syndrome. I was like, that is crazy. How how do they know where this is going? But after watching more than three, I was like, okay, like I see a pattern here. Like there's a structure. And then a friend of mine who had already been through the process, he offered to explain me what's the general like overview on casing. So I was like, all right. So now I understand how they came up with all this. It's not that they're super smart. It's just like they've practiced <laughs> <laughs> and they... They have, they know where, where to go next. Right. Yeah. You, you, you definitely get a feel for like, oh, there is a way to, to structure things and go about this, that if you are seeing it for the first time, I agree, it sort of can feel a little bit like, wait, how did they know? How did they just come up with that structure? And then it just magically led them to like the right answer. Yeah. So yeah, I get absolutely. that. Tell me a little bit, you know, you mentioned, okay, like, at the end of the day, like what you really need to do is get in, just practice, practice, practice. As you were going through and doing that practice in your process, how did you identify what areas you thought you needed more work on? And like, how did that process shake out? Yeah. So every time I did a practice case, I asked for feedback, obviously. And I wrote down all the feedback in like a spreadsheet and I started identifying patterns. So okay, there's been 10 people who have told me that I should be faster in math or all these people have recommended me to be more confident and like hard skills and also soft skills. Um, so I wrote down those pieces of like the major feedback that I've gotten over and over again. And I literally put, like wrote them down in post-its and put them on my computer to remember it every time I did a new case. And that's how it became more like a habit. Um, so it, it was just internalizing this piece of feedback one by one. And not when I had already mastered something, then something else came up. Or when I thought I was fine with a piece of feedback, it came back, like the same old habits came back. So it was like a very iterative process, a lot of resilience. A lot, it, it's also an emotional journey, um, but it worked yeah. at the end. You mentioned, and I don't know if this was just an example you threw out, but you said, oh, you know, like, okay, I need to be faster at math. And then you mentioned at one point, like, be more confident, which yeah. I get. And it's an important thing. It's it's also one of those things that I think everyone, to some extent, struggles with, like, yeah, like how, 
if you realize it's an issue, like how do you actually build that confidence? And I'm just curious since you threw it out there, like, did you have certain things that you felt like you did that actually like those things specifically helped you build confidence in the process? Yeah, I think when when someone perceives that you have a lack of confidence is because you give them certain cues. So in a case, for example, when you ask if every number is correct, instead of just keep going after doing a calculation, that's lack of confidence. So I stopped asking and I was like, if I'm not right, they will stop me. So I just kept going. Or asking if, asking if you can ask questions, asking if you can get two minutes to build a framework, like asking everything is lack of confidence. Mm -hmm. um, so there was definitely that. And just be convinced that the answer that you're giving is the best thing that you came up with. Maybe it's not the best overall, but for you at that moment, it is. And if it's wrong, they will let you know and they will help you. Uh, it's just like learning that it's not only them evaluating you, but also you evaluating the company. Yeah. So that helped me build that confidence. Yeah. That last point is a good point. I mean, it's a, it's a two-way process. Like you want to make sure it's a good fit as well. Um, exactly. And I think what you mentioned earlier, like the, the ask the, how you ask questions, that's actually a really good tactical point. I've never heard anyone phrase it that way before, but there is something about like, you know, in my experience, when you're doing like mock interviews or real interviews and the candidate just like is constantly asking for permission, you're sort of like, I'm just like, yeah, yes, yeah, so you can, We're you can ask sorry. the question, just ask. Or like exactly. yeah. what you mentioned about the repeating numbers thing actually is like a pet peeve of mine, because like if I if I start a case and the prompt just has a lot of numbers on it and I feel like someone is just asking me and clarifying every number to buy time or just weirdly because they think they need to. I'm like, well, this is just a, we don't need to say like 10 is 10 and five is five. Like if you exactly. heard the numbers, like let's just let's get on with the show. Um, exactly. So I, I hear you on that front. That is also saying, I'm sorry. I think women and especially Latin women tend to be very apologetic. So I realized every time I was wrong, I would, I apologize. Now I was so sorry. And they said like, stop saying sorry. It's just say like, oh, that's a great catch. Thank you. And move yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, I, I think that is another good point and another good, it, it, interesting, like hits on just cultural and certain people's like certain people ingrained more to just oh I'm I'm sorry or just be more apologetic yeah. and yeah the reality is you're thinking out loud and doing the stuff on the fly anyone that doesn't realize like okay like you may make a mistake here or there like is is as long as you catch it and just address it, it you know absolutely happens, right like yeah. that, that happens to everyone on the job and I think to some extent actually finding like a little error as you're going through a case and just handling it maturely and being like, oh, whoops, realized I did this instead of that. Let me just correct that and move on. Like people are like, oh, that's great. Cause like, that's going to happen on the job. And I imagine they also want to see how you address your mistakes and how you handle that stress of being wrong. So I, I guess it's even beneficial to just be wrong once. Yeah, can be in some cases. Um, tell me a little bit about as you were going through the process and you know you were at Darden so probably had hundreds maybe 200 other students going through consulting interviews at the same time you've got a cohort doing it as you were looking around and watching friends processes versus what you were doing did you find at any point that you were doing something that was very like any aspect of your prep that was very different than your friends and if so like what was it and do you think that was a meaningful difference for you yeah well, I think this like master guide that I did is something that I didn't hear anyone else doing. Um, and it was definitely helpful because it was tailored for me and what I needed and like my special specific areas of improvement. So that was helpful. Um, and also these practice of finding patterns on my feedback. Um, I think sometimes you get caught up with a feedback of one specific case and maybe yeah. just, it was just one case, right? Like maybe you were distracted or whatever, but it's more seeing the overall picture and see what's your progress and what areas are really like stagnant and need more work. Yeah, I think that's that's smart and resonates with me as well because like you said, you can over-index on one person's feedback. And especially when you're casing and if you're doing a lot of casing with peers, like no interviewer is perfect. Right. And so they might, that person might be really great at math. So like what they call out is math, but like it might not be the most important thing, but if you're tracking it and you've done 
you know, I don't know how many cases you did, 50, whatever cases, and you start to see the patterns, I think that is an effective way to, to do it. How many cases did you end up doing, do you think, if you re remember as you were going through the prep process? Yeah, I ended up doing 70 cases. Okay. So which good. was definitely a lot more than my peers. Um, I personally never felt I was over casing because I would never got like overwhelmed or needed like a, like a mental break. Some peers did, and that's perfectly fine. So I don't think there's a magic number. Um, yeah. Some people did 20 cases and they got the job. So. Yeah. <laughs> so by the time you walked into the actual interviews, you'd done you know, all this case prep, you've got Danielle's master guide, you've got, you know, 70 cases under your belt. Was it still scary walking into them or did you feel really confident? I think at that point I was like, it is where it is. I did my best. I was sure I did my best and I didn't think I could get any better. So I was just like, this is me, <laughs> take, me take me or leave me. <laughs> right. um, and also it was, interesting because all my interviews I I just recruited at the end for two companies um all my interviews were on the same day so mm. I had six different interviews on the same day and I was just like so prepared to be exhausted and it was a lot so I just I just try to be confident with what I knew did you run into any um either in those first rounds where they're all piled in one day or going through the process, did you run into any that felt like, oh, this was like a train wreck? And if so, you know, uh, like how did you deal with that mentally? My very last one of the day was, a, it was a disaster because I was so tired um, and I couldn't do a very simple like addition. It was, it was terrible. At the end, the interviewer had to like cut me off and tell me the result. Um, and at the end of the day, the good thing about this process is that they call you the same day. So BCG that I interviewed first with, they call me and they say, you got the job. So I was super happy and <laughs> relaxed. And I, when I got the other re re uh, rejection, I was like, yeah, I deserve that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it certainly helps if you've got one offer under your belt, it, right? Like it takes a lot of the pressure off and, and things like that. Exactly, for sure. exactly. There's a phrase that people talk about in, in sort of all walks of life. I don't exactly remember where it came from, but like seeing the forest through the trees, uh, you know, like the idea of basically like some people like they get wrapped up in like all these details and they just lose the big picture, right? Now that you've been through the process of recruiting for consulting and going through strenuous and all this case prep, what, like in your opinion, what is, what is the forest? What? What are the big things that you need to keep in mind as you're going through and trying to do, you know, all these little tactical things that you mentioned, like how to make sure I clear a chart the right way, et cetera? Well, I think all of us put a lot of work, all the candidates put a lot of work, and all of us learn to solve a case in a similar way. So we all get to the same result, but what is going to set you apart is your personality. And I think sometimes we forget about that and building a connection with the interviewer. And I don't know, it just telling some anecdotes that the, the case reminds you of or uh, smiling or those things, I think that they're so important. And it's feedback that no one ever tells you. It's normally very tactical. Um, so I think that's one forest. And the other one is just the progress in general. Like look at you, how you started, how are you now and how much you've improved and be proud of it, I think. And walk with that pride to the interviews. Yeah, I like both those points. Um, I think they're both very important. I think the, you know, let your personality shine through, have some fun with it. I mean, it's a, hard, it's a hard thing to say. It's not the most fun process, but I think if you can recognize, you know, this isn't like a life or death thing, it's just like, you know, and, and, and lighten up a little bit and make real connections, that helps. That helps. Exactly. People and like what I tell my coaches is like, think that this interviewer is doing... 50 interviews in one day like he's also exhausted he's also sick of it so it just help him have a good time you know and and, and you will also relax relax yeah. if you walk in with that mindset <laughs> versus trying to be a robot who gives a perfect answer because that's all the rest of the candidates yeah yeah exactly and I think the last the other point you mentioned too is great like at the end of the day 
you know, you go through this process, you're building certain skills. If those skills lead you to landing whatever that dream job is, that's great. If not, but you've spent, you know, two months, three months getting really good at structuring problems and walking through the, you know, gnarly nebulous case on the fly. That's great. That's, that's skills that you get to deploy wherever else you go in your career and your personal life. I mean, that, that like literally that concept you brought up is one of the reasons why I started rocket Bucks because I was like, Oh, this is, if you can just help people like build these skills, that's awesome. That that's a great thing that they can have with them forever. Problem solving. It's useful for everything. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay.